And now to some development projects. Over 38,000 jobs will soon be available in the Niger Delta region with the Livelihood Improvement Family Enterprise Programme. It's an initiative of the Niger Delta Development Commission, the NDDC, in partnership with International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. Highlighted at a one-day stakeholders meeting in Port Hackett, the River State Capital. The NDDC Acting Managing Director says that the objective is in support of the federal government's agricultural policy and strategic framework for youth employment. This interactive forum between the Niger Delta Development Commission and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, is to fashion out modalities on how to create opportunities for people in the region for the $129.21 million Livelihood Improvement Family Enterprises Project. The NDDC Director of Special Duties reiterates the commitment of the agency to partner with development organizations to the benefit of the region. The project, Livelihood Improvement Family Enterprises, Niger Delta Life ND, has an overall goal of realizing a transformed rural economy in the Niger Delta, from which the rural population can derive prosperity and equal benefits. The Director, Agriculture and Fisheries at NDDC gives the assurance that the Commission will continue to support IFAD to integrate rural dwellers into agricultural entrepreneurship. The overall objective is to transform the Niger Delta region economy through Africa. And what are the immediate objectives? The immediate objective, of course, is poverty and evasion, food security and their job creation. Iford Country Representative believes the partnership will provide more opportunities for the region and is keen to see the success of the program. They look at over 50% of the population in Nigeria and it's not different in the Niger Delta and also the women are 50% of the population. And the priority for the government of Nigeria and the Federal Ministry of Agriculture when it comes to agriculture is to give opportunities to this youth and to these women in agriculture. We are going to ensure that we attain sustainability in all these ramifications. We are talking about social sustainability, financial sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. If realized, the livelihood improvement family enterprises should create jobs and reduce youth restiveness. More stories now on the government college Ibado is marking its 90th anniversary and series of events have been lined up to celebrate the school's history of excellence and rich traditions. With the theme 90 years of service to the nation, the old boys are not only celebrating but also working at restoring the school's old glory. Founded in 1929, the Government College Ibadan was modelled after the British secondary boarding school system. The school earned the enviable status for producing many of the country's leading professionals. A long list, but the old boys represented by their president and his vice say they are awarding limited number of personalities as part of events lined up for the celebration. The few ones that represent far less than 1%. The school had well-resourced classrooms, laboratories and sports fields. Now, the old boys say they're providing the school with these facilities and also restore the old rich culture. Some old boys have provided water, some have renovated the laboratories, some have renovated the classrooms. An old boy has built the road from the beginning of the school to the end in excess of 1.5 kilometers. And, um, the offers continue to come and a set is completing the fencing of the school. I want you to imagine how big government college is, bigger than most universities. Part of the discipline and character gained from GCI was actually embedded in the boarding house and that is why we've, we seem to have a debt of leadership in Nigeria today. We've scrapped boarding houses generally and uh, the vision of the GCI OBA is to reintroduce boarding house. We are working with the government and uh, we will be able to achieve that. So we have two boarding houses rebuilt by two old boys at a phenomenal cost. 
Different generations and sets are revisited in the school to jog the memories they love to speak fondly about. We start the day with what we call a sing song. Government College has its own set of songs. Every GCI boy knows the songs offered. And then we will sing these songs for about 45 minutes at the top of our voices, from the oldest boy who's probably 90 years old to the youngest boy, and we'll all be singing. Dr. Babalakin says the old boys have collectively injected 500 million naira to the redevelopment of the school to give the new crop of students similar experience to what they had. Brilliant support for education there. You're watching the news at 10 on channels television. Let's cross over to business news now with Melinda Kinlami. You first, first bank. Many thanks, Gimba. Welcome to Business News. Reactions are trailing President Buhari's budget presentation as some economists are pleased that enough attention is being given to how revenue will be generated. The highlight of the budget for some of the panelists on Channel's television is the legal backing to the value-added tax increase and the introduction of concerns raised. I'm delighted to know that a number of the issues that many of us have raised um, regarding what needs to go together with a VAT increase have now been introduced, and, and I'm hoping it's going to be passed. So uh, registration threshold has now been introduced uh, so that the very uh, micro, I mean, small and micro businesses can be shielded from, from some of the impact. We've also seen that the exemption uh, list had been expanded to actually include uh, more necessities so that the very low and vulnerable can actually be uh, uh, protected. If you take the health and the education number together, it's 100 billion naira. Now, if my math is correct, that's 500 naira per person in Nigeria. So how much education, how much health care are we going to get for that amount of money? This, for the population we have, these are tiny, tiny numbers. And I think that um, where what we don't see in this budget is what the speaker said at the end. He said it's a time for bold action. So we've said for years we need to grow 6 to 8 percent a year to make any difference to poverty, make any difference to unemployment. So 6 to 8 percent a year requires total investment, private sector and public sector investment of 40 trillion naira a year. Speaking on revenue sources, some panelists believe that the 200 billion naira for stamp duties is not realistic as the country should collect not less than 1 trillion naira. These stamp duties, they've been collecting it for the past five, six, seven years. Many of us have sent FYI requests to say, where is this money going? And they've been telling us stories and fables. Suddenly, you have simply 200 billion naira for 2020. What has happened to the money that they've been collecting in previous years? Where is the money? They need to account for it. They need to tell Nigerians where it is. And I'm also insisting that 200 billion from the volume of stamp duties we do every day, even in my little organization, I know how much we do in a year cannot be a realistic estimate. We need to collect not less than a trillion naira from stamp duty. So that particular revenue source is grossly underrated and undervalued. There are signals that the National Assembly will work in, um, um, will work in collaboration with the executive to ensure that the proposed budget and in terms of everything that has to do with the, the complete um, um, process of the budget circle from preparation to enactment to implementation to oversight or uh, audit, if you, will, if you may, with, um, I'm, I'm definitely sure that with the commitment the Ninth Assembly has in terms of working at equilibrium with the President, I see the budget being passed by December. But it is important to ensure that the committees, because the committee is the engine room of the National Assembly, as emphasized by the Speaker, go to work and ensure that every proposal is scrutinized However, the budget presentation had no impact on the equities market today as bearish sentiment maintained dominance at the close of today's trading session. Layo Adegoki tells us more. Thank you for joining us on the Stock Market Report. In spite of slightly positive performance from four out of five key sectors of the equities market, the NSE's main index ended in negative territory for a second day, down by 0.21%. The additional loss comes largely on the back of over 1% loss in MTN Nigeria and Guinness, as well as some other mid-cap equities, 
down by 20 billion naira, closer to 12 trillion naira lower level. Sell pressure remains evident on share price of 14 gainers, which were led by 9.57% drop from Champion Bureys, while 12 equities recorded price increase, led by 10% gain from Nascon. However, overall volume of shares transaction for today was higher by 34.23 million units compared to Monday's session at 185.94 million in 3,083 deals, while trio of Zenit Bank, FCMB and GT Bank at the top on the trades list. That's the Stock Markets Report. I'm Layo Adegoke. That's Business News Tonight. Back to you, Gimba. Brilliant. Many thanks indeed, Melinda. A source in the UK Prime Minister's office says that the Brexit deal is essentially impossible off a phone conversation between Mr Boris Johnson and the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Though details of the call have not been made public, the source suggests that Ms Merkel told her counterpart the only way to break the deadlock is for Northern Ireland to stay in the customs union and for it to permanently accept EU single market rules on trade and goods. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news around, in around the world in five. Good evening from the Channel's newsroom here in London. The Turkish Defence Ministry has said that all preparations are completed for a military incursion into northern Syria. Framing the operation as humanitarian, the ministry said in a tweet, the establishment of a safe zone or peace corridor is essential for Syrians to have a safe life by contributing to the stability and peace of our region. It comes hours after President Donald Trump threatened to destroy Turkey's economy if the country goes off limits following his surprise decision to pull US forces out of northern northeastern Syria. In a series of tweets, Mr. Trump defended his move, which could open the way for Turkey to launch an attack on Kurdish fighters across the border. The withdrawal was heavily criticized, even by Mr. Trump's Republican allies. We've captured, we defeated this group largely, defeated ISIS 100 percent of the caliphate, 100 percent. And they say, well, maybe we could stay longer. I say, well, when do we get out? There's going to be a time we get out. We have to bring our people back home. Ecuador's president has temporarily moved government operations from the capital Cueto to the port city of Guayaquil amid protests sparked by the end of fuel subsidies. <laughs> president Lenin Moreno said he would not back down on the fuel price hike and accused his opponents of attempting a coup. It came after more protests and road blockades led by indigenous groups. Hundreds have been arrested amid Ecuador's worst unrest in years. Indigenous-led protests have toppled three presidents in the last few decades. The Netherlands Prime Minister Mark Rutte has visited New Zealand for the first time since being elected into his role. He met New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern to discuss free trade agreement negotiations with the EU and online counter-terrorism strategies. They then participated in a climate change panel at the University of Auckland following the release of a joint statement stating their commitment for climate action. The Caribbean islands that are part of our kingdom are especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So, although the Netherlands and New Zealand could not be further apart geographically, we are natural partners in this respect. And that's why I'm delighted we have signed a joint statement today highlighting our shared commitment to combating climate change. Meanwhile, over in Sydney, in Australia, climate change protesters were arrested on the second day of two weeks of demonstrations. One man suspended himself from Story Bridge in Brisbane as part of the Extinction Rebellion global movement. Others dressed as bees and pretended to lie dying in the city's Hyde Park. The U.S. has blacklisted 28 Chinese organizations for their alleged involvement in abuses against ethnic Uyghurs in China's Xinjiang province. The organizations are now on the so-called entity list, which bars them from buying products from U.S. companies without approval from Washington. The 28 targets include both government agencies and technology companies specializing in surveillance equipment. Chinese video surveillance giant Hikvision is one firm on the list and says it is assessing the potential impacts of the move. China has reacted angrily, dismissing the US allegations as groundless. An attack on motorists in the western German town of Limburg is being investigated as terrorism, security sources have told German media. On Monday, a man hijacked a lorry and ploughed into eight vehicles waiting at a traffic light, injuring 
eight people. Seven people were treated in hospital. Local media report that a 32-year-old Syrian man has been arrested. Five more wild elephants have been found dead after plunging down a ravine in Thailand following the discovery of six elephants this weekend. A spokesman for the Department of National Parks announced that five more elephants' bodies were discovered on Tuesday after the drone images revealed a further five levels of waterfalls that previously aerial photos could not capture. Khao Yai National Park rangers used drones to look into the bottom of the ravine that the six others had fallen down and then drowned in raging water on Saturday. It's thought they were attempting to rescue a three-year-old member of the herd that had fallen into the waterfall. And finally, three scientists have been awarded the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics for groundbreaking discoveries about the universe. On awarding the prize, the Royal Swedish Academy of Scientists said this year's laureates had transformed the world's ideas about the cosmos. James Peebles was awarded half the prize for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology, while Mikael Mayer and Didier Queloz shared the other half for their discovery of an exoplanet orbiting a solar-type star. And that's your international news around the world in five.